Hello, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Reading Little Blue Books Out Loud While Stoned. Today, we're going to start part three of Little Blue Book, I believe it is number 49, titled Three Lectures on Evolution, written by Ernst Haeckel. And Ernst Haeckel wrote this, there is no copyright date, but he wrote these three essays around 1905, 1906, so this is all knowledge that they had then, not what we have now. This is just what they had then in 1905. And this is, oh, 50 years after Darwin and the theory of evolution. Um, so it's still fresh. All right, so here we go. We're going to start with a brand new one. Let me see. To make sure I left off at the right one. Yep. Okay. So, here we go. Three lectures on evolution. And this must be the second lecture. Because this is the only one. Either way. There's no uh, table contents. New lecture. The struggle over our genealogical tree. Our ape relatives. And the vertebrate stem. In the previous chapter, I tried to give you a general idea of the present state of the controversy in regard to evolution. Comparing the various branches of thought, we found that the older mythological ideas of the creation of the world were driven long, ag were driven long ago out of the pro province of inorganic science, but that they did not yield to the rational conception of natural development until a much later date in the field of organic nature. Here, the idea of evolution did not prove completely victorious until the beginning of the 20th century, when its most zealous and dangerous opponent, the Church, was forced to admit it. Hence, the open acknowledgment of the Jesuit, Father Wassman, deserves careful attention and we may look forward to a further development if his force of conviction and his moral courage are strong enough. He will go on to draw the normal conclusions from the high scientific attainments and leave the Catholic Church as the prominent Jesuits, Count Hassenbrock and the able geologist Professor Renard of Gant, Ghent, G -H -E -N -T, Ghent, one of the workers on the deep sea deposits in the Challenger expedition have lately done. But even if this does not happen, his recognition of Darwinism in the name of Christian belief will remain a landmark in the history of evolution. His ingenious and very Jesu Jesuitical yeah, Jesuitical Jesuitical? doesn't sound right, attempts to bring together the opposite poles will have no very mischievous effect. It will rather tend to hasten the victory of the scientific conception of evolution over the mystic beliefs of the church. You will see this more clearly if we go on to consider the important special problem of the descent of man from the ape, and it's irreconcilability with the conventional belief that God made man according to his own image, that this ape or pithecoid, Pithi pithecoid, yeah, P-I-T-H-E-C-O-I-D, pithecoid theory is an irresistible deduction from the general principle of evolution was clearly recognized 45 years ago when Darwin's work appeared by the shrewd and vigilant theologians. It was precisely in this fact that they found their strongest motive for vigorous resistance. It is quite clear. Either man was brought into existence like the other animals by a, by a special creative act, as Moses and Linné taught, as an embodied idea of the Creator, as the famous Agassi put it so late as 1858, or he has been developed naturally from a series of mammal ancestors as is claimed by the systems of Lamarck and Darwin. In view of the very great importance of this pithcoid theory, 
We will cast a brief glance at its founders and then summarize the proofs in support of it. The famous French biologist Jean Lamarck was the first scientist definitely to affirm the descent of man from the ape and seek to give scientific proof of it. In his splendid work, 50 years in advance of his time, the Philosophe Zoologique, yeah, Zoologique, 1809, he clearly traced the modifications and advances that must have taken place in the transformation of the man-like apes, the primitive forms similar to the orangutan and the chimpanzee, the adaptation to walking upright, the consequent modification of the hands and feet, and later the formation of speech and the attainment of a higher degree of intelligence. Lamarck's remarkable theory and, the, and this important consequence of it soon fell into oblivion. When Darwin brought evolution to the front again 50 years afterwards, he paid no attention to the special conclusion. He was content to make the following brief prophetic observation in his work. Light will be thrown on the origin and the history of man. Even this innocent remark seems so momentous to the first German translator of the work, Braun, that he suppressed it. When Darwin was asked by Wallace whether he would not go more fully into it, he replied, I think of avoiding the whole subject as it is so much involved in prejudice, though I quite admit that it is the brightest a most interesting problem for the thinker. The first thorough works of importance on the subject appeared in 1863. Thomas Huxley in England and Karl Vogt in, German, in Germany endeavored to show that the descent of man from the ape was a necessary consequence of Darwinism and to provide an empirical base for the theory by, wit, by every available argument. Huxley's work on man's place in nature was particularly valuable. He first gave convincingly in three lectures the empirical evidence on the subject, the natural history of the anthropoid, apes, the anatomical and embryological relation of man to the next lowest animals, and the recently discovered fossil human remains. I then, 1866, made the first attempt to establish the theory of evolution comprehensively by research in anatomy and embryology, and to, de to determine the chief states in the natural classification of the vertebrae, vertebrates that must have been passed through, through by our earlier vertebrae ancestors. Anthropology thus becomes a part of zoology. In my history of creation, I further developed these early evolutionary sketches and improvements were made in the successive editions. In the meantime, meantime, the great master, Darwin, had decided to deal with this chief evolutionary problem in a special work. The two volumes of his Descent of Man appeared in 1871. They contained an able discussion of sexual selection or the selective influence of sexual love and high psychic activities connected therewith and their significance in regard to the origin of man. As this part of Darwin's work was afterwards attached with particular, oh, attacked with particular villages, I will say that, in my opinion, it is of the greatest importance, but not only for the general theory of evolution, but also for the psychology, anthropology, and aesthetics. My own feeble early efforts in 1866, not only to establish the descent of man from the nearest related apes, but also to determine more precisely the long series of our earlier and lower vertebrae ancestors, had not at all satisfied me. In particular, I had had to leave unanswered in my general morphology the, the very... Turning of the page... The very interesting question, from which invertebrate animals the vertebrate stem originally came? A clear and unexpected light was thrown on it some time afterwards by the astounding discoveries of Kowalski. Yeah, Kowalski, who revealed an essential agreement in embryonic development between the lowest vertebrate and a lowly tunicate. 
Tunicate? 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 T-U-N-I-C-A-T-E. In the succeeding years, the numerous discoveries in connection with the formation of the general layers in different animals so much enlarged our embryolo embryological outlook that I was able to prove the complete homology of the two-layered gastrula. Yeah, gastrula, a cup-shaped embryonic form. In all the tissue-forming animals. In my monograph on the sponges, from this I inferred in virtue of the biogenetic law the common descent of all the metazoa from one and the same gastrula-shaped stem form. The gastria, this hypothetical stem form to which man's earliest multicellular ancestors also belong, was afterwards proved by Monticelli's observations to be still in existence. The evolution of these very simple tissue-forming animals from still simpler unicellular forms, protozea, is shown by the corresponding process that we witness in what is called the segmentation of the ovum or gastrulation in the development of the two-layered germ from the single cell of the ovum. Encouraged by these great advances in modern phylogeny, there's that word again, P-H-Y-L-O-G-E-N-Y, phylogeny, and with the support of many new discoveries in comparative anatomy and embryology, in which a number of distinguished observers were at work, I was able, in 1874, to venture on the first attempt to trace continuously the whole story of man's evolution. In doing so, I took my stand on the firm ground of the biogenetic law, seeking to, seeking to give a phylogenetic cause for each fact of embryology. My evolution of man, which made the first attempt to accomplish this difficult task, was maternally improved and enlarged as new and important discoveries were made. The latest edition, in 1903, 1904 in English, con contains 30 chapters distributed in two volumes, the first of which deals with embryology or ontogy on onto ontogeny. Ontogeny. O N T O G E N Y. And the second with the development of species or phylogeny. So phylogeny is the development of species, and that first one, uh, embryology. Okay. Though I was quite concise that there were bound to be gaps and weak points in these first attempts to frame a natural anthrop anthrop anthropogeny, I had hoped that they would have some influence on modern anthropology, and especially that the first sketches of a genealogical tree of the animal world would prove a stimulus to fresh research and improvement. In each, oh no, in this I was much mistaken. The dominant school of anthropology, especially in Germany, declined to suffer the introduction of the, the theory of evolution, declaring it to be an unfounded hypothesis, and described our carefully prepared ancestral trees as mere figments. This was due, in the first place, to the great authority of the founder and president for many years of the German Anthropological Society, Rudolf Virchow, as I briefly pointed out in the previous chapter. Not one of Virchow's numerous pupils and friends can appreciate more than I do his real services to medical science. His cellular pathology of 1858, his thorough application of the cell theory to the science of disease is, in my opinion, one of the greatest advances made by modern medicine. Okay. Cottonmouth is kicking in, so. Got to fix that. And then induce more of it. There we go. All right. Back to it, the great storyteller. When the... The Marquean theory was brought to light again by Darwin in 1859. Many thought that it was Virchow's vocation to take the lead in defending it. 
He had made a thorough study of the problem of heredity. He had realized the power of adaptation through his study of pathological changes. And he had been directed to the great question of the origin of man by his anthropological studies. He was at that time regarded as a determined opponent of all dogmas. He combated transcendent transcendentalism either in the form of ecclesiastical yeah ecclesiastical creeds or anthropo anthropomorphism anthropomorphism after 1862 he declared that the possibilities of a transition from species to species was a necessity of science when i opened the first public discussion of darwinism at the Stetton Scientific Congress in 1863, Virchow and Alexander Braun were among the few scientists who would admit the subject to be important and deserving of the most careful study. When I sent him the, in 1865, two lectures that I had delivered at Genoa on the origin of the genealogical tree of the human race, he willingly received them amongst his collection of popular scientific lectures. In the course of many long conversations I had with him on the matter, he agreed with me in the main, though with the prudent reserve and cool skepticism that characterized him. He adopts the same moderate attitude in the lecture that he delivered to the Artisans' Union at Berlin in 1869 on human and ape skulls. His position definitely changed in regard to Darwinism from 1877 onward. At the Scientific Congress that was then held in Munich, I had, at the pressing request of my Munich friends, undertaken the first address on 18th of September on modern evolution in relation to the whole of science. In this address, I had substantially advanced the same general views that I afterwards enlarged in my, in my monism riddle of the universe and wonders of life. In the ultramontane capital of Bavaria, in sight of a great university, which empathetically describes itself as Catholic, it was somewhat bold to make such a confession of faith. The deep impression that it had made was indicated by the lively manifestations of assent on the one hand and displeasure on the other, that were at once made in the Congress itself and in the press. On the following day, I departed for Italy, according to an arrangement made long before. Virchow did not come to Munich until two days afterwards, when he delivered on 22nd of September, in response to entreaties from people of position and influence, his famous antagonistic speech on the freedom of science in the modern state. The gist of the speech was that this freedom ought to be restricted that evolution is an unproved hypothesis and ought not to be taught in the school because it is dangerous to the state. We must not teach, he said, that man descends from the ape as any other mammal. In 1849, the young monist, Virchow, had empathetically declared this conviction that he would never be induced to deny the, the theist of... I think it's theist. The prince kind of doubled... Theist and turning the page. Yeah. Deny the theist of the unity of human nature and its consequences. Now, 28 years afterwards, the prudent dualistic politician entirely denied it. He had formally taught that all the bodily and bodily and mental processes in the human organism depend on the mechanism of the cell life. Now he declared the soul to be a special immaterial entity. But the crowning feature of this reactionary speech was his compromise with the church, which he had fought so vigorously 20 years before. The character of Virchow's speech at Munich is best seen in the delight with which it was at once received by the reactionary and clerical papers, and the profound concern of all liberal journals, either in the political or the religious sense. When Darwin read the English translation of the speech, he generally so gentle in his judgments, wrote, Virchow's conduct is shameful, and I hope he will someday feel the shame. Ooh. In 1878, 
I made a full reply to it in my Free Science and Free Teaching, in which I collected the most important press opinions on the matter. From this very, from this very decided turn at Munich until his death, 25 years afterwards, Virchow was an indefatigable and very influential opponent of evolution. In his annual appearance at Congresses, he was always contested. He has always contested it, and has obstin obstinately clung to his statement that it is quite certain that man does not descend from the ape or any other animal. To the question, whence does he come then? He had no answer, and retired to the resi resigned position of the agnostic, which was common before Darwin's time. We do not know how life arose and how the various species came into the world. His son-in-law, Professor Rabble, has tried to draw attention once more to his earlier conception that has declared that even in latter years, Virchow often recognized the truth of evolution in private conversation. This only makes it the more regrettable that he always said the contrary in public. The fact remains that ever since the opponents of evolution, especially the reactionaries and the clericals, have appealed to the authority of Virchow. The holy reactionary system that this led to has been well described by Robert Drill in 1902 in his Virchow as a Reactionary. Has li how little qualified the great pathologist was to appreciate the scientific base of the pictoid theory is clear from the absurd statement he made in the opening speech of the Vienna, Vienna Congress of anthropologist in 1894, that man might just as well be claimed to descend from a sheep or an elephant as from an ape. Any competent, competent zoologist can see from this the little knowledge Virchow had of systematic zoology and comparative anatomy. However, he retained his authority as president of the German Anthropo Anthropological Society, which remained impervious to Darwinian ideas. Even such vigorous contra controversial controversial controversialist as Carl Vogt and such scientific partisans as of the ape man of Neanderthal as Schaffenhausen could make no impression. Virchow's authority was equally equally great for twenty years in the Berlin Berlin press, both liberal and conservative. The Kruzentong, Kruzentong, we're going to spell it, K-R-E-U-T-Z-Z-E-I-T-U-N-G, it's a German paper, Kruzentong, and the Evangelique Kruzentong, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely probably butchering that German, we're delighted that the learned progressionist was conservative in the best sense of the word as regards evolution. The ultra-montane Germania rejoiced that the powerful representative of pure science had, with a few strokes of the crudel, reduced to impotence the absurd ape theory and its chief protagonist, Ernst Hackel. The national Zutong could not sufficiently thank the free-thinking popular leader for having lifted from us forever, the oppressive mountain of the theory of simian descent. The editor of the Volkszeitung, Bernstein, who has done so much for the spread of knowledge in his excellent popular manuals of science, obstinately refused to admit articles that ventured to support the erroneous ape theory refuted by Virchow. Virchow. It would take too much space to attempt to give even a general survey of the remarkable and erroneous literature of the subject that had accumulated in the last three decades in the shape of thousands of learned treaties and popular articles. The greater part of these works have been written under the influence of conventional religious prejudice and without the necessary acquaintance with the subject that can only be obtained by a thorough training in biology. The most curious feature of them is that most of the authors restrict their genealogical interest to the most manlike apes, 
and do not deal with their origin or with the deeper roots of our common ancestral tree. They do not see the wood for the trees. Yet it is far easier and safer to penetrate the great mysteries of our animal origin if we look at the subject from the higher standpoint of vertebral phenology. Philog phil there's that phylogeny and go deeper into the earlier records of the evolutionary history of the vertebrates. I'm going to pause there because I got caught in that. Who'd ever thunk it? Since the great Lamarck established the idea of the vertebrae at, at the vertebrate, at the beginning of the 19th century, 1801, and his Parisian, Parisian colleague, Cuvier, shortly afterwards recognized the vertebrates, vertebrates as one of his four chief animal groups. The natural unity of this advanced section of the animal world has not been contested. In all the vertebrates, well, I don't know why that gives me a, doesn't sound right to me. From the lowest fishes and amphibians up to the apes and man, we have the same type of structure, the same characteristic disposition and relations of the chief organs, and they differ materially from the corresponding features in all other animals. The mysterious affinities of the vertebrates induced go, gold 140 years ago, long before the, before Coover, I know I'm butchering both of them, to make prolonged and laborious studies in the comparative anatomy as Genoa and Weimar, just as he had in his Metamorphosis of Plants, established the unity of organization by means of the leaf as the common primitive organ. He, in the Metamorphosis of the Vertebrates, found this common element in the vertebral theory of the skull. And when Culver established comparative anatomy as an independent science. This branch of biology was developed to such an extent by the classic research of Johannes Mueller, Carl Gegenbauer, Richard Owen, Thomas Huxley, and many other morphologists that Darwinism found its most powerful weapons in his arsenal. The striking difference. Oop, turning of the page. Come on. <coughs> Pardon me. The striking differences of external form and internal structure that we find in the fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals are due to ad adaptation to the various uses of their organs and their environments. On the other hand, the astonishing agreement in their typical character that persists in spite of their differences is due to inheritance from common ancestors. The evidence thus afforded by comparative anatomy is so cognate that anyone who goes impartially and attentively through a collection of skeletons can convince himself at once of the morphological unity of the vertebrae stem. The evolutionary evidence of comparative onto ontogeny and embryology is less easy to grasp and less accessible, but not less important. It came to light at a much later date and its extreme value was only made clear by means of the biogenetic law some 40 years ago. It shows that every vertebrate, like every other animal, develops from a single cell, but that the course of its embryonic development is peculiar and characterized by embryonic forms that are not found in the invertebrates. We find in them especially the cordula or cordula rab. Boy, I don't know how to pronounce that. Cordula rava, a very simple worm-shaped embryonic form without limbs, head, or higher sense organs. The body consists merely of six very simple primitive organs. From these are developed steadily the hundreds of different bones, muscles, and other organs that we afterwards distinguish in the mature vertebrate. The remarkable and very complex course of, his, of this embryonic development is essentially the same in man and the ape 
and in the amphibians and fishes. We see it in accordance with the biogenetic law, a new and important witness to the common descent of all invertebrates from a single primitive form, the cordia. But important as these arguments of comparative embryology are, pardon me, one needs many years study in the unfamiliar and difficult providence of embryology before one can realize their evolutionary force. There are, in fact, not a few embryologists, especially of the modern school of experimental embryology, who do not succeed in doing so. It is otherwise with the palatable proofs that we take from a remote science, paleontology. The remarkable fossil remains and impressions of extinct animals and plants, giving us directly the historical evidence we need to understand the successive appearance and disappearance of the various species and groups. Geology has firmly established the chronological order and sedimentary of the sedimentary rocks, which have been successively formed of mud at the floor of the ocean, and has deduced their age from the thickness of the strata, and determined a relative date of their formation. The vast period during which organic life has been developing on the earth runs to many million years. The number of variously estimated at, at less than a hundred, or at several hundred million years, if If we take the smaller number of 20, 200 million years, we find them distributed amongst the five chief periods of the Earth's organic development in such a way that the earlier or archaeozoic period absorbs nearly one half as the sedimentary rocks of this period, chiefly gneisses and crystalline schints are in metamorphed condition. The fossil remains in them are unrecognizable. In the next succeeding strata of the Paleozoic period, we find the earliest remains of fossilized vertebrates, Solarian primitive fishes, and Ganoids. These are followed in the Devonian system by the first Dipsnoit fishes, Dipnost fishes, a transitional form from the fishes of the amphibia. In the next, the Carboniferous, Carboferi, Carboniferous system, we find the first terrestrial or four-footed vertebrates, amphibians of the order of the Stego, Stegocephalia. A little later in the Permian rocks and the earliest emnototes lowly lizard-like reptiles make their appearance. The warm-blooded birds and mammals are still wanting. We have the first traces of the mammals in the Tri Triassic, the earliest sedimentary rocks of the Mesozoic Age. These are of the mono monotreme subclass. They are succeeded by the first marsupials in the Jurassic and in the Jurassic. The ancestral forms of the Placentals in the Cretaceous. From the lowest common ancestral group of the Placentals proceed our divergent branches, the legions of the Carnacea, Rodents, Ungulates, and Primates. The Primate Legion surpasses all the rest. In this, Linne long ago included the lemurs, apes, and man. The historical order in which the various stages of vertebrate development make their successive appearance corresponds entirely to the morphological order of their advance in organization. As we have learned it from the study of comparative anatomy and embryology, these paleontological facts are among the most important proofs of the descent of man from a long series of higher and lower vertebrates. There is no other explanation possible except evolution for the chronological succession of these classes, which is in perfect harmony with the morphological and systematic distribution. The anti-evolutionists have not even attempted to give any other explanation. The fishes, dipunets, amphibians, reptiles, 
mounted, mounted trees, marsupials, placentals, lemurs, apes, anthropoid apes, and ape men are inex inseparable links to a long ancestral chain of which the last and most perfect link is man. One of the paleontological facts I have quoted, namely the late appearance of the mammal class in geology, is particularly important. This most advanced group of the vertebrates comes on the stage in the Triassic period, in the second and shorter half of the organic history of the earth. It is represented only by low and small forms in the whole of the Mesozoic age, during the domination of the during the domination of the reptiles. And I think that is where we will stop for part three. Thank you for listening. This has been part three of Little Blue Book number 49, titled Three Lectures on Evolution by Ernst Hackel, written approximately 1905 to 1906. Thanks for listening and join me in part four.